You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast. www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony. Looks like it's time for one of our occasional little refresher courses here at the Lovecast on the meaning of tolerance. If you were paying attention last week, if you so much as glanced at Twitter, you learned that Vice President Mike Pence doesn't dine alone with women who aren't his wife, Karen. Karen, who Pence calls mommy. Ronald Reagan called Nancy Reagan mommy. Quick digression, Reagan and Pence both belong to the political party that's absolutely overrun for the last three or four decades with anti-gay nutjobs who think there's something creepy and revealing and incesty going on when younger gay men call their older gay boyfriends daddy. But these creeps can call their wives mommy, and that's okay. Anyway, the news about Mike and mommy caused a firestorm on Twitter. There was some serious commentary and liberal hand-wringing because deals get cut over dinner and careers get made. To steal a phrase or to borrow a phrase from a Broadway musical, which is my favorite thing to do, Women want to be in the room where it happens, and that room in Hamilton and in Washington generally is off in the dining room at dinner time. Mike and Mommy also came in for a lot of mockery. There wasn't just serious commentary. Mike doesn't eat alone with other women to prevent him from cheating on his wife. That is Mike's Pence's words. That's how he describes it. He can't be trusted alone with someone at dinner, which suggests that all that stands between Mike and adultery is his wife physically. If Mike is out of sight, little Mike is out of his pants. Jeremy Hooper, uh, the blogger and author, nailed it in three short tweets. It's always astounding how straight Christian men admit the fragility of their sexuality slash fidelity. VP can't dine alone with other women? Same with gay stuff. Undercurrent of their war has always been idea that straight men are one tempting penis away from suction. Bizarre. Whereas, Jeremy goes on, you can put me in the middle of a sex club and I assure you I will stay both gay and faithful to my husband. You should be following Jeremy on Twitter at good as you. The Onion, God bless The Onion, weighed in with this hysterical headline. Mike Pence asks waiter to remove Mrs. Butterworth from table until wife arrives. The article is just as funny as the headline. Go read it. This is all too much for Melinda Henneberger, opinion columnist at the Kansas City Star. Progressives are a Twitter. Get it? A Twitter? Over the revelation that Vice President Mike Pence doesn't dine alone with women who aren't Mrs. Pence, Hennerberger wrote. Isn't it up to the vice president to decide the kind of marriage and social life he wants to have? Hennerberger's editor weighed in on Twitter. Pence's marriage outrages the intolerant. Isn't it up to the VP what kind of marriage he has? All right, this is where I have to step in and call bullshit on Hennerberger and her editor and the Kansas City Star and everyone out there on Twitter making this argument now. Because if it were up to Mike Pence, I wouldn't have any kind of marriage at all. No gay or lesbian couple would. People were being intolerant of Mike and Mommy's marriage. People were, gasp, having opinions about Mike and Mommy's marriage. And that's different. Remember, tolerance, to tolerate, it means to put up with. It doesn't necessarily mean to celebrate or accept uncritically or to refrain from having opinions about or to refrain from making fun of. You can tolerate something. You can be totally tolerant and still have an opinion about that something, even a low opinion of that something. I am perfectly willing to put up with Mike Pence's marriage, which includes all these silly rules to keep his dick out of women who aren't mommy. Ugh. And you know what? I personally don't care if Mike and mommy think my marriage is sick and depraved and sinful, that it has one too many penises or whatever they think about my marriage. If Mike can put up with my marriage... He's tolerant. If not, then no. Then Mike is not tolerant. And Mike Pence, throughout his political career, has demonstrated over and over and over again that he cannot put up with same-sex marriage. He famously backed directing HIV prevention funds to conversion therapy programs. So Pence actually isn't willing to put up with or tolerate my existence, much less my marriage. And to style Pence now as the victim of intolerance because a lot of people, including a lot of straight people, made fun of this silly rule is bullshit of the highest order. And you know what we shouldn't tolerate? We shouldn't tolerate bullshit. And speaking of tolerance and bullshit and women and Mike Pence, while we were all debating Mike Pence's 
dinner plans, Pence, in his role last week as president of the Senate, cast a tie-breaking vote. He cast a couple of them. One of his votes made it possible for states to do what the federal government, the Republicans running it, would very much like to do, defund Planned Parenthood one state at a time in this case, instead of all 50 states all at once. Now, Planned Parenthood all along hasn't been able to spend federal funds on abortion services. So these cuts, these defunding of Planned Parenthoods all over the country, it's going to result in fewer cancer screenings for women, but not women Mike Pence dines with, so fuck them. And Pence's vote is going to result in decreased access to contraceptives, which will, wait for it, drive the abortion rate up or back up. Abortion rates are at historic pre-Roe v. Wade lows right now, thanks to increased access to contraception over the last decade. Pushing policies that result in more unplanned pregnancies, which drives up the abortion rate, while at the same time making abortion harder to access, that's going to kill women. And you have to take my word for it, according to a study published in the medical journal The Lancet, the highly credible, peer-reviewed, much-lauded medical journal The Lancet, making abortions harder to get isn't associated with fewer abortions, as Chelsea Polis pointed out this weekend on Twitter. It only results in more women dying from unsafe abortions. You know, personally, I could give a shit about Mike Pence's marriage, and I'd like him to do me the same favor, not give a shit about my marriage. And I'm really not all that concerned about the women who would want to eat with Pence and can't. I'm much more concerned with the women out there whose lives are imperiled, thanks to Mike Pence. But yeah, it's fun to talk about Pence's dinner plans. I did too on Twitter last week and his impure thoughts about Mrs. Butterworth. But let's try to keep this in perspective. A small number of conservative women aren't going to dine with Mike Pence. A large number, a much larger number of women are going to die because of Mike Pence. All right, coming up today on the micro and magnum editions of the Savage Lovecast, Erica Moen from Oh Joy Sex Toy is here with her monthly sex toy recommendation. And coming up on the magnum subscription edition of the Savage Lovecast, which you can subscribe to at www.savagelovecast.com. Dr. Terry Conley is here for a What You Got to share the results of a new study comparing the relative happiness of monogamous and non-monogamous couples. That's on the Magnum. This episode is brought to you by CISO, the subscription streaming service that delivers the very best comedy. Sign up for one month free by going to CISO.com and entering the promo code SAVAGE. This episode of The Lovecast is brought to you by NatureBox, delicious, healthy, tasty snacks delivered right to your door. Get 50% off, 50% off your first order when you go to naturebox.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. Long time listener, first time caller. Um, I have a two part question. My boyfriend of about a year, we've been friends for like 20 years, so there's a good connection there. He's very kinky. We kind of have a dom sub relationship, and um, he has a kink that I don't want to do. He loves smoking and wants to see me smoke and I just find it completely appalling and I've done some vaping for him but it's not enough he wants more smoke and uh, he wants me to compromise and I just find it horribly appalling but uh, maybe I could do a hookah I don't know or indulge him in some other way something creative I'm not sure what and I told him that you know we could come up with something together if if he could indulge me in something, but I haven't told him what that is. My issue is he doesn't stay hard. It takes him a long time to come, but uh, he kind of loses his erection after like, I don't know, 10 thrusts or so. And then we have to play around for a little bit and then it gets back up and it goes back and forth for a while. And I need really hard cock. And I've tried to ask him about Viagra, and he just kind of brushes me off. So I don't know how to bring it up. Like, that is what I want. I want him to take Viagra and see if that helps. But I don't want to hurt his feelings because it's not a choice. It's his bodily function. So I don't want to insult him. But anyway, how can I indulge his fantasy without being disgusted with cigarette smoke? And how can I bring it up to him that I would really like him to take Viagra because I need a hard cock? Vaping seems like a perfectly adequate and reasonable compromise. I was going to suggest candy cigarettes, which you just blow out the end of and a little puff of powdered sugar flies out of them. I would not take up smoking to indulge a partner 
with this particular fetish or kink. I am all for, as everyone knows, good giving and game. But game has always had a qualifier. Game for anything, dot, 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 within reason. It is unreasonable to expect someone who is not a smoker to take up smoking, which is dangerous and unhealthy, and to most non-smokers, revolting and disgusting, the smell and the taste, for your dick or your pussy. It is unreasonable and therefore it trips the dot 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 within reason escape clause on general ggg ishness so you should not go there for him vaping and I, sometimes i'm walking down the street trapped behind some idiot with what the kids call a douche flute which is what they call those vaping dildos people put in their mouths on the streets and they create such enormous clouds of horrifying looking but not too stinky so i'll take them over the goddamn smokers vape smoke that not only does it seem like a perfectly reasonable and adequate compromise, but you're giving him a whole lot more of what he wants, which is smoke pouring out of your mouth. People who are walking around vaping look like burning buildings. If vaping isn't good enough for him, candy cigarettes. If candy cigarettes aren't good enough for him, nothing. Now, when it comes to his dick, I wouldn't make this a tit for tat. I will smoke for you if you get a hard dick for me. I think this is separate conversations. Your desire for some hard dicking isn't a kink. It's just about sort of baseline sexual functionality. And that's where you begin this conversation. And it's going to be potentially a very awkward one for him. You can suggest Viagra. You can say to him, you know, 10 thrusts and you pull out and you get hard again and you're back in and it's all good. But some uninterrupted dicking would be great. Have you tried Viagra? Shall we incorporate a cock ring? What can we do? And you may learn when you approach this issue that he's already tried Viagra, which is why he shies off the subject. Doesn't work for all men. And if indeed this is just how his dick works and Viagra isn't going to do anything and Cialis isn't going to do anything and a cock ring is not going to really help, you may have to just work with and around his dick. And you have an option when it comes to some hard dicking, which is dildos and toys and vibrators that can be incorporated into the sex play. He may not be able to go more than 10 thrusts without having to pull out and play with himself a little bit or roll around with you for a little bit, get hard and dive back in. But he can long dick you with a toy. And you can then present that as a your kink for my kink if you're going to be willing to take up smoking for this. And you shouldn't, please don't. But you could indulge him a little smoking if he can indulge you in some sex toy play using sex toys, using dildos and vibrators and plugs. And you can get your never-ending dicking from them with him there to help. Good luck. Hey, Dan. I'm a 29-year-old man from the Midwest. I've noticed a strange trend on social media lately. Maybe you can explain it to me. I have a lot of progressive friends. Many of those friends who are otherwise sex positive and non judgmental have been declaring that certain body parts are not sexual and that sexualizing those parts is oppressive. It started out with nipples. I'm fully in support of a woman's right to breastfeed or go bare chested in public, but it seems like a stretch to say that nipples are only considered sexual because of cultural conditioning. Then people started saying that nudity is not sexual. For example, that there's nothing sexual about sending nude selfies to your friends when you're feeling confident about your body. The latest version of the trend is this quote, if we really want to protect our children, we need to let go of this antiquated repressionist need to sexualize our genitalia. I have no idea what that means, but it got a surprising amount of Facebook likes. I think genitalia are sexy. I think nudity is sexy. And I think nipples are sexy. I probably like most people get pleasure from showing off my own body and looking at other people's bodies. I think declaring body parts non-sexual is repressive, shaming, and not helpful. Can you help me break down this trend? Who is right here? I'm with you. Declaring body parts non-sexual does seem repressive, shaming, not helpful, sex negative. Also a complete and total fucking waste of time. We sexualize body parts. We sexualize. There are people out there who have fetishes about rubber bathing hats. They've sexualized swim caps to tell people you can't or shouldn't sexualize genitalia or nipples or shoulder blades or feet or earlobes is a waste of time. People are going to have the reactions that they have. You shouldn't make someone who's breastfeeding in public feel uncomfortable by drooling or staring. You shouldn't sexualize someone or make them aware that you are sexualizing them or a particular part of their body at a time where they're not inviting you to. But if they're sending around pictures of their naked bodies, they're inviting you to look at them as sexual objects. 
And if they feel they have to cross themselves and somehow self-exonerate by saying, here's my naked fucking body, which is likely to arouse you, but if you sexualize me at this moment, there's something fucking wrong with you. Bullshit. That is some sex-negative, double-reverse, backflip bullshit. And you do not have to cooperate or participate. You don't have to like those posts on Facebook, and you don't have to waste time hanging out with people who perform such bizarre and inane contortions when it comes to human sexuality. We sexualize bodies and not just bodies. We sexualize inanimate fucking objects, materials, clothing. Oh, yeah, everything is potentially sexualizable and not everything is sexualized by everyone in quite the same way. And everyone should be very respectful of who they're sexualizing or what they're sexualizing and when and where they're doing it. But to declare it out of bounds yeah, not how the human brain, human erotic imagination works. And we can shake a finger at it, but it's never going to change. They say laughter is the best medicine. And if the Republicans have their way, it may be the only medicine that we are left with. And CISO may be the best medical insurance you're able to buy in America. It's a streaming service that provides complete coverage for stand-up television and original content. With CISO, you get unlimited access to CISO original series, next day late night, hilarious stand-up specials, binge-worthy classics, including 42 seasons of Saturday Night Live, the entire Monty Python catalog, the IT crowd, and more. Plus, CISO brings stand-up right to your living room with exclusive content from today's best comedians, on-demand and commercial-free. Sign up now to catch brand new stand-up specials from all sorts of stand-ups, plus our other favorite podcast, My Brother, My Brother, and Me, in their brilliant foray into television. Nancy loves it. She won't shut up about it. I have pledged to watch it this weekend. Or watch your favorite sets from comedians like Louis C.K., Amy Schumer, and Hannibal Burris. Access CISO content from anywhere at any time using iOS, Android, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Windows, or Xbox One. CISO is just $3.99 per month. That's $3.99 per month, not $399 per month for all the comedy you could want anytime, anywhere, ad free. Just go to seeso.com right now to sign up for one month free with promo code SAVAGE at checkout. That's seeso.com, spelled S E E S O.com, promo code SAVAGE. Hi, I have an interesting to me relationship situation. Um, I uh, it is a work colleague. And she actually is uh, one of my bosses. Uh, sometimes we travel a lot for work. Um, we started as a friendship and would go out for dinners with groups. And um, one time it was just the two of us. We definitely had some cocktails and drinks and um, fooled around. So uh, we talked about it after. Uh, she even said, you know, let's not make it weird. And I said, absolutely. Two consenting adults, friends with benefits. Um, until after that, it sort of, she sort of escalated it. Now, both of us are married. Um, I am in a, uh, relationship. My spouse is okay with, with, especially when I'm at work and traveling that, um, yeah, sort of an open situation. And, uh, this is actually the first time I've acted upon it. So she's been texting and chatting with me, but she it keeps getting more serious. Like I'm not giving her enough time. And I, keep going back to like, oh, I thought we were just like, when we're together, we're together at work. When we're not, you know, obviously we keep in touch, but um, I'm being, uh, getting the feeling that I'm not giving her the attention that she wants, or maybe she wants it to be something more. I've tried to placate her. It's tough because we are working together quite a bit to make that work tolerable, but I'm starting to get frustrating by her needing more than I am willing to give. Also, it would be in our work situation, it would be very awkward all around if uh, she decided to be really upset with me. So any advice on how to maneuver a what I thought was friends with benefits in a work situation to making it as comfortable as possible to be able to still travel and work? Document everything save the emails in whatever ways she's communicated with you about her desire for a more intense emotional connection or any other way she's communicated to you that she wants more of a girlfriend experience from you then you're able or willing to provide document all that shit because you're going to have to go to this woman who is your superior in the workplace and tell her no tell her that what she's asking from you you are not able to give 
And she may retaliate, and then you may have a sex discrimination, workplace sexual harassment suit on your hands where you have to go to whoever her bosses are and complain about how you're being retaliated against for these reasons. Hopefully it won't come to that. But if it does come to that, you're going to want those emails and those text messages and everything else saved and handy. And there's no way to avoid the awkwardness here. Demands are being made upon you by someone with power over you that has you hesitating to speak up for yourself. And you're going to have to just go to her and and, and lay it out. You're going to have to say no to this person who could fuck your life up and fuck your career up, but hopefully won't. But if she does, you may then have to fuck her life up a little bit and fuck her career up a little bit. Again, hopefully it won't come to that. But she's making demands on you. And because of the power differential here, because she is your boss or one of your bosses, you are being sucked into a relationship that makes you uncomfortable. You're probably doing things with her now that you do not want to do. That's fucked up. And you need to extricate yourself from that. And there are risks and dangers in the extrication process when it comes to a workplace entanglement like this. And you need to be prepared just in case the worst should come to pass. And this is why people often recommend not fucking Other folks at work, particularly overlings and also, again, underlings. Only fuck your equals at work if you're going to fuck people at work and then hope they never get promoted or demoted. We're going to take a quick break from our calls to talk to our friend Erica Moen for Sex Toy Rex. That's Sex Toy Recommendations. Erica Moen is the cartoonist behind Ojoy Sex Toy, a weekly comic about sex toys and sex education. You can find it at ojoysextoy.com. And she joins us by phone once a month for the sex toy recommendation of the month. Hey, Erica. Hey. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Good. So, Erica, what is your big sex toy rec for the month of April? The Doxy. It is my most favorite, favorite toy. Uh, It's sort of like the magic wand, which used to be called the Hitachi magic wand, but then Another company bought it named Vibertex, and now it's just called the Magic Wand. But anyway, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm the talking about the wand? Doxy. And it, yeah, it is, it's like a great big Magic Wand. It's got a mm-hmm. great big head on it, and it has this huge long body. So it's kind of that classic image that most people associate with uh, the classic vibrator. And it is so powerful, and it's so strong, and the head is super, like, it's firm, but it's really soft. And there's a really good weight to the handle of it, which I guess could be a bit cumbersome. But uh, I don't know. I like. I just. I like the way it feels in my hand. I. I like the way it feels elsewhere. Uh, it's, just, it's my most favorite toy. <laughs> so it's, it sounds like a, kind of like a vibrating cricket bat or something. The way you described it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's. It's really. It, it's very big. And uh, yeah. I. It just. It's so powerful. Is it bigger than the classic Hitachi Magic Wand? Is this sized up? It's not significantly bigger. And, oh, God, I hope I'm not getting this wrong. I, I don't have both of them side by side right now. But I think it is, like, just a smidge bigger. Um, it does have a great big cord. So if you want cordless, you'd still have to go with uh, Vibratex's magic wand. But mm-hmm. I don't know, like, I, I don't mind the cord because the the ride is so good. It's so worth it. <laughs> and what do these run? Uh, it's about $135, which is an investment, but like it can take a beating. So it's, it's something like you'll pay $135 now and it's going to last you for years. So if you just like divide how many years you have it by $135, it's, I think it's worth it. I think you should divide how many orgasms you will have with it by the cost. Oh my God, then it's just pennies. <laughs> so some people out there will hear it's really powerful. It's got a really big head. It really gives you a thumping, intense uh, vibrate vibration and worry about mm-hmm. uh, becoming dependent on it or being too intense. Why do some people need that kind of intense uh, vibration and why should people who may not need it not fear it? Uh, well, I mean, some people need really intense stimulation. I, I mean, I'm somebody who was pre-orgasmic until I tried a, a vibrator for the first time. So some people, your genitals, like, it, they're just not going to tip over that point and reach orgasm until they get actual vibration, which, I mean, if we lived in the Stone Age, that would be really unfortunate. But fortunately, we live in the future, so we have these machines that can just, like, <laughs> bring you to climax in the snap of a finger. Or mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and I don't know why that whole dependency thing, I guess for some people that could be true. But then again, like, is it so bad to be dependent on something that effectively gives you an orgasm? Like, if the choice is 
I guess no it's, orgasm. I, I, guess or, it's, I guess it's bad if the thing is a vibrator. If the thing's a girlfriend, a husband, a wife, a non-binary friend, it's okay. And that just may be tech phobia and vibra shame. Yeah, I think this is definitely tech phobia and vibra shame. One important note for people out there when you talk about really intense uh, vibrators that, that offer a very powerful uh, degree of stimulation, most of women's clitoral tissues are buried inside their body. The clitoris mm-hmm. that we talk about as the clitoris is just the head, just the glands. There are the clitoral wings, mm-hmm. there are these erectile chambers, and a lot of that tissue is very, you know, it's buried in the body under layers of skin and muscle and fat, and to to, to stimulate it, you need, some women really do need this kind of intense stimulation. You, know, you watch guys jack off, and some guys pay a lot of attention to the head. And that's all they really need. And they're just Mm -hmm. jacking the head of their dicks. But some guys are like really working the shaft. And a woman who wants to work the shaft of her clitoris, and you do have a clitoral shaft, you have two of them, can't work Mm -hmm. the shaft from outside the body without something like a powerful vibrator. Yeah, I just, I I don't see a problem with building up a quote unquote dependency on a, on a, a tool that helps you get there. And, uh, and I just want to say, as somebody who didn't orgasm until I started using vibrators, once I started using vibrators, it taught my body like, oh, this is how my arousal response works. This is what gets me there. Mm-hmm. And then after I started orgasming with the aid of vibrators, I was able to learn how to do it with my hand. So like, it's not just, oh, you'll, you'll get stuck on the vibrator for life, which I don't think is a bad thing. It can also like be a really good aid to teach you how to do it yourself and to teach you like, oh, that's what an orgasm is. That's how I got to get there. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's a good thing. And once again, the recommendation this month, the name and where they can find it. My recommendation is the Doxy uh, Massager, and you can get it from doxymassager.com. And it's $135, and I totally think it's worth it. Erica Moen, she is the cartoonist behind Oh Joy Sex Toy, a weekly comic about sex toys and sex education, which you can find at ojoysextoy.com. Thanks so much, Erica. Talk to you next month. What do you do when you want a snack, but all you can find is junk food and crap? You rely on your self-control to resist the temptation? No, please. You eat the junk food. You eat whatever's at hand and handy. That's why you need to start snacking healthy by having Nature Box handy and at hand. Nature Box makes snacks that actually taste great and are better for you, created with high quality ingredients that are free from artificial colors, flavors, or sweeteners, so you can feel great about snacking again. My current favorite snack is the garlic plantains, and Nancy is a fan of the cheddar lentil loops. The millennials all seem to like the sweet things like the Greek yogurt pretzels and the animal cookies, but that is because they are children. Nature Box recently made their service even better. Now you can order as much as you want, as often as you want, with no minimum purchase required, and you can cancel at any time. It's simple. Go to naturebox.com and check out their snack catalog. There are over 100 snacks to choose from, and they're constantly adding delicious new snacks. Choose the snacks that you want, and they will deliver them right to your door. With NatureBox, you'll never get bored. There are new snacks each month inspired by real customer feedback. And if you ever try a snack that you don't like, NatureBox will replace it for free. free. And right now, NatureBox is offering you guys 50% off your first order when you go to naturebox.com slash savage. Support the Lovecast. Go to naturebox.com slash savage for 50% off your first order. naturebox.com slash savage. Hey, Dan, here's my issue. Um, So I've been seeing this new guy who has an amazing dick, but every time I blow him, I pee myself. I've had some minor issues with leaking, like when I sneeze or when I run, but it's like a tiny little splash, not enough to soak through my clothes. But when I'm on my knees and I go down on him, I'll have that leakage if I'm like choking or gagging. But if he comes in my mouth, I straight up lose control and piss on the carpet. I always go to the bathroom before sex because I don't want to have to stop to pee in the middle of fucking. So how do I prevent this? It's really embarrassing. Also, should I be worried that this is a health issue? I've always associated urinary incontinence with older women and moms, not healthy childless ladies in their 20s. One of the primary features of the advice racket is the appearance of omniscience. You appear to know everything your readers, your listeners, they think you know everything because you only play questions that you have answers for. You don't play the questions that you don't have the answers for. Except this time, this time right now I am playing a question that I don't have an answer for. Maybe a listener out there 
has an answer. I have some theories. Why do you pee yourself a little bit when you run? Well, your reproductive organs are scrambled together with your excretory organs. I'm not sure quite how that word is pronounced. Excretory. I'll go with that pronunciation. Correct me if I'm wrong. And there are people who, when they exercise, become aroused. Dr. Herbenick, Dr. Debbie Herbenick from Kinsey Institute and Indiana University has come on this very show to talk about what she dubbed corgasms. People who, when they exercise, have orgasm. Mostly women have this superpower. I don't want to call it a problem. And there are then some people who, when they climax, women, uh, will pee a little bit. Some people argue and there are two sides to this debate that female ejaculate is just urine and that there are women who expel urine when they climax. Maybe when you're running, you're becoming aroused and there's a little bit of pee. Maybe when you're given that blowjob, maybe you're just so aroused. Maybe there's an arousal response that causes you to wet the carpet. What can you do about it? You could talk to a doctor about it. You could listen to the show next week where I'm sure we will get a lot of feedback uh, about your question. Uh, but you could talk to a doctor about it or you can move those blowjobs from the room with the carpet to the room with a hardwood or tiled floor or to the bathtub. Hi, Dan. I've been dating my boyfriend for a little under a year, maybe 10 months. And my question involves his drinking and smoking activities. Um, I wouldn't say that he drinks and smokes excessively all the time, but when he does, he goes way overboard with it. As a matter of fact, when he gets really drunk, he ends up pissing his pants. Um, This has happened about six times in the time that we've been dating. So it's like after a big wedding or going to a concert and drinking all day, anything like that. It's not like he walks around having wet his pants in public, but he'll come home, go to sleep, and a couple hours in, He'll piss him. And he has a small bladder in general. He has to go to the bathroom a lot when he is conscious. So I think he's just a little bit too unconscious uh, to wake himself up. This makes me really mad. And I usually don't talk to him for a day or two afterwards because it usually happens in my bed. The last time, as a matter of fact, this morning, um, after I had noticed that he had drank way too much and came home way too late, I actually forced him to sleep on the floor next to the bed like a dog. And there I woke up and to the sound of him peeing. So yeah, he peed on my floor this time at least, so I didn't have to fix my whole bed up. Anyway, I'm just wondering what you think about this. He needs to seek professional help. Um, He needs to just fucking grow up and stop drinking so much. Is he an alcoholic? Is this just a problem because he has a small bladder? Uh, Should I dump him because of this? I'm just wondering because I'm too embarrassed to tell anyone else about it. We played your call and we took a vote in the room and it was unanimous Nancy Hartunian, Dan Savage, each and every one of the tech savvy at risk youth who are at work today, we would all dump this asshole. Less than a year, six times in less than a year, he has wet your bed. Not because he has an issue that would elicit sympathy, not that he has a bladder control problem, not that he has an incontinence issue, not that he's 70 and you're a gerontophile and sometimes you just have to roll with that. No, he gets hammered, 31 years old, gets shit faced drunk, so drunk he can't wake up in the middle of the night and walk to a bathroom. Yeah, no. And he knows this is a problem. He knows when he has that third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth beer, vodka, soda, whatever the fuck, pisco sour, whatever it is he's drinking, that that means tonight I will wet my girlfriend's bed and he keeps drinking and then he crawls into bed with you. No, that is some deal breakery shit. You say to him, if you don't want to take the DTMFA advice, you say to him, when you are this drunk, I am sending you home to your house. When you are this drunk, you may not sleep in my house. So you go up to him when he orders that third drink and you say, you're sleeping at your house tonight. You are not coming home with me if you have that third drink or whichever drink is the tipping point drink. And if he regularly chooses to get that drunk, if he regularly chooses to piss the bed, that that's more important to him, being so drunk he's going to piss the bed than being with you, then that gets us back to DTMFA land. That gets us back to we're all looking at each other in the room. We're all making eye contact right now. It's a big crowd in here today nodding our heads when uh, dumping this motherfucker comes up. Yeah, deal breakery shit. Somebody who pissed my bed six times in a year, not at my request because that wasn't my thing, that guy would not be invited back, drunk or sober. Hi, Dan. I'm a 23-year-old male who's been dating a 22-year-old female for a little over a year and a half. Uh, she's my first real girlfriend um, and the first girl I've ever been in love with. 
I'm going to be moving to California to start grad school in the fall. It'll be three years. I'll be getting my MFA, and I'm super excited. My girlfriend and I have been planning to move together, uh, but the closer the decision comes, the more I'm kind of having second thoughts about it. Uh, we'll be living in graduate housing in a high-income area, and the program's fully funded with a generous stipend, but I know we're going to have to be stingy. Um, she says she's okay with this but I'm worried that she won't be um, when the reality of our day-to-day -day sets in. And, you know, I'm busy with school and she's hopefully at a job that she likes, but um, I can't really know, you know, what that is going to look like for both of us. I write three to four hours every morning and um, she's accepted this uh, so far in our relationship, but I'm afraid that, you know, just as kind of the workload escalates for grad school, she's going to start feeling neglected. Um, I don't want to set her by the wayside um, while I'm, you know, pursuing my dream, uh, but I also don't want to compromise my own productivity. Her moving with me, though, is kind of dependent on the expectation that we're going to travel after I graduate, which I'd love to do, but I'm also concerned that my career opportunities might get in the way of it. Um, I don't want her to move out here based on a promise I can't make right now. So I don't know. Am I about to ruin a good thing or am I kind of right to be second guessing this commitment right now? You have two options. She comes with you. She doesn't get to see much of you or you have a long distance relationship for this time. And it doesn't sound like it's going to be a long time that you're in this program. And you just put both of those on the table. Come with me. You're not going to see much of me. And then if she comes with you and she is resentful because of the time pressures and the constraints and logistical limitations and the amount of time you're going to get to see her, you just remind her that this was part of the deal. She accepted this, that she would see very little of you during this time. Or you do the LDR thing where you're not going to see much of each other, but when you do see each other, it's going to be a weekend that you've cleared and you have nothing else to do but her and vice versa. So you will see each other rarely, but when you are together, you will be together. And then you got to let her make her choice. And if she comes and she doesn't get to see much of you and the relationship sours and it ends, then it ends. And if she doesn't come and you guys are long distance, and the relationship falls apart, then it falls apart. You just have to make your choices, uh, roll your dices, move your mices. As for that other issue around traveling, if you have committed to her that you will travel with her for a time when this program is over, if she comes out there and offers you – I don't know, some financial support if she's going to be helping you float this or just logistical support because she's going to be helping with meals or house cleaning or just emotional support. You owe it to her then to come through with the travel. You owe it to her then to delay the beginning of your professional career. Presumably, whatever opportunities come your way at the end of this program are going to be the only opportunities that come your way ever. So you can say to prospective employers, I'm taking six months off after this, or you can just delay applying for jobs until you're back from your travels with your long-suffering patient and still their girlfriend. Hey, Dan. So I was a 25-year-old woman from the uh, Midwest, and I really like to sleep around with a lot of guys. And I identify as queer, but I, I do tend to end up with a lot of guys who are presumably straight or mostly straight. And the, the sort of the, the sleeping around and the doing things for their pleasure and feeling really desirable is sort of my thing. Like that's sort of my kink, I guess, if you could call it that. I don't know, but it's a huge turn on for me. But I don't necessarily want to go all the way to orgasm myself all the time or even a lot of the time. Um, it takes a long time. I find it kind of stressful. It doesn't always work. And like, I don't know. Sometimes I just, I find it more enjoyable to just skip it. So my question is, is that just skipping it? Is that like reinforcing the sort of tendency for, especially for sort of straight boys uh, to ignore a woman's physical needs or like to not, you know, pay back their partner? I don't know. I guess I'm just kind of worried that contributing to that and I like what I do and I don't want to be creating a negative environment for other people they might sleep with in the future. 
Interesting your call should come this week. I was just this week reading a study at the Journal of Sex Research titled Do Women's Orgasms Function as Masculinity Achievement for Men? Quoting here from the abstract, orgasms have been promoted as symbols of sexual fulfillment for women and have perhaps become the symbol of a woman's healthy sex life. However, some research has suggested that this focus on women's orgasms, though ostensibly for women, may actually serve men. Basically, what the study found when they looked at 810 men who were attracted to women is that their investment in your orgasm isn't necessarily about your pleasure, but about their ego. It makes them feel manly to get you off. So they're constantly checking in about whether you're aroused. So they need many of these men, you to come for them, not for you, for them. And perhaps that's better than guys who just don't care whether you come or not and could give a shit, and those guys are definitely out there. Maybe this is a better guy to end up in bed with, a guy who's really invested in your orgasm for his own selfish reasons. Perhaps better than a guy who could give a shit about your orgasm for similarly selfish reasons. That said, all you got to do in a case like this is use your words. If you're going to bed with a guy and it's not about you coming, all you have to do is say before you go to bed – Sometimes I don't come. Sometimes it really takes a lot to get me off, and I'm not always up for doing that work, so you can relax. This is going to be about you and you coming, not necessarily about me climaxing. And then you're off the hook, pressure-wise. You can come or not come. If you change your mind in the moment and want to come, you can throw yourself at it. If not, you've already conditioned the guy not to expect it to be about your orgasm. And if he has a meltdown then he's clearly one of the guys that this study was about. One of these guys who your orgasm is about him, not about you, about his ego, not about your pleasure. And if he's one of those guys, you should run screaming from the room. Hey, Dan. I'm a 34-year-old female living in the Pacific Northwest. I've been single about four years. I've tried dating. No one has really interested me. However, I met a guy. He's 27. Met him about two months ago. We have amazing chemistry. We enjoy each other's company. And we were having incredible sex. So about a month ago, the condom broke. He hadn't come yet, but he was really nervous. And I explained to him that my period was about two days away. So he asked if I would take plan B, to which I said, no, I didn't think it was necessary. I like to stay away from pumping hormones into my body. He was very anxious. My period did come in the next two days, and we had a sit down talk about it. So I know my body really well. I tried to tell him about the rhythm method and he just, he wasn't having it. So we haven't had sex since. He knows I'll never be on birth control. I also told him I'd never have an abortion. I would like to have a kid in the next couple of years, but I'm certainly not trying to get pregnant right now. And he knows that. And we've had multiple sit down conversations about it. So we're pretty much blue in the face. He has suggested alternatives to vaginal sex, uh, dildos, anal, pretty much anything else. And while I do consider myself GGG, I do need to have sex. That's the bottom line. I think it promotes bonding when you're, when you're dating someone, and it should be the fun and the easy part. He even suggested I sleep with other people, which I'm not really interested in that right now. So he says that getting me pregnant would be the worst thing of his life, and he's not willing to risk the 2% chance of condom failure. So Dan, I do validate his feelings, but I feel like he's being a little immature and needs to act more like a man. I told him I would take plan B if it was, ne- if it was warranted. If the condom broke, he came and I was ovulating, I certainly would take plan B. That would be another conversation. Um, I've tried to educate him on the rhythm method, He said he would look into it, but at this point, we are not having sex, and it's really frustrating. So, Dan, are there any suggestions, or do you think I should move on and find someone to fuck me? His body, his choice. If a guy called in who was pressuring his girlfriend to engage in what she regarded as high risk for pregnancy sex when she did not want to be pregnant, when a pregnancy for her would be a disaster, it would be my job and everyone would expect me to tell that guy that he was an asshole and tell his girlfriend if she should happen to be listening to break up with him. The same applies here. You are pressuring this guy to have sex with you in a way that leaves him feeling vulnerable and uncomfortable. That seems to him to be high risk for pregnancy and he's just not down and his 
body, his dick, his choice. Period. The end. You assailing his masculinity is not helpful and is kind of an asshole move. If you were a real man, you wouldn't have this problem. No. You are 34 years old. You would like to get pregnant in the next two years. He knows that. He's not comfortable with rhythm. Condoms fail and one failed with you. And so he's just not comfortable having penetrative vaginal intercourse with you. If that is unacceptable to you, break the fuck up with him and date someone else. But recognize that you have options other than pumping your body full of hormones and other than anal sex or non-penetrative sex with him for the rest of your life. There are non-hormonal interuterine devices, IUDs, that you could get that aren't going to pump your body full of hormones, which may make him much more comfortable. The combo of rhythm condoms IUD as opposed to the combo of rhythm condoms dot, dot, dot. So there's something you could do proactively if it's his dick that you want, which is get an IUD, which is highly effective and can be safely removed in a year or two when you are ready to get pregnant and have that baby. But his body, his choice. Sounds like he's made his choice. He's not putting his dick in you. If that's a deal breaker for you and it sounds like it is, you two need to part ways. Hi, Dan. I'm calling in with a comment about episode 544. Uh, the guy who called in asking about the trans woman's penises um, is clearly a chaser and fetishizes trans women. I'm surprised that you didn't catch that and a little disappointed. Did you notice that he didn't once refer to them as women just saying transsexuals or how he kept saying the penis instead of her penis? I'm really disappointed that you didn't catch that and call it out for what it was. Please educate yourself more on the unique types of misogyny that trans women face. Hey, Dan, I'm just calling on this uh, comment on show 544, the guy who is interested in a trans girl but doesn't want to interact with her dick. Um, as a guy who was in this position pretty recently, I've got to say, I know where you're at. I know that you like the idea of her having a dick and you like probably thinking about her dick and seeing it maybe in porn, but you're really nervous about taking that final plunge. Uh, well, I can say that I recently hooked up with my very first trans girl, uh, and while we were going at it, she said, do you want to suck my dick? And I thought, why not? And it turns out I liked it. So my advice to you is take the plunge, suck the girl's dick. Uh, I was calling in with a comment with regards to um, the lady who is expecting and whose husband is squicked out, so to say, by having sex with her. I just wanted to add that I don't know if that's a fairly common thing to have happen, it might be. But what I did want to say is that there is definitely people out there that are not squicked out by that. As a lesbian human myself, I don't know why, but I am totally down for having consensual sex with pregnant ladies, uh, especially if it's going to help them in their laborious processes get shit going. So, yeah. Don't worry. If he doesn't want to do you, there's somebody else out there, lady, who will do you because you guys are hot. Before we let you go, we're going to remind you that we have a big show coming up in Portland, Oregon, a live taping of the Savage Lovecast, our Easter extravaganza on April 14th at Revolution Hall. Go to portlandmercury.com slash Easter for tickets. You're going to want to be there. All right, we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to record a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. Read my syndicated sex advice column, Savage Love, every week in the Pittsburgh City Paper and other newspapers around the world. Follow me on Twitter at FakeDanSavage. Follow Erica Moen on Twitter at Erica Moen. And if you want to hear more from Terry Connolly, and you do, check out her TED Talk Mythbusters Gender and Sexuality Edition. You can find it by Googling Terry Connolly and TED Talk. Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at Risk Youth and Nancy. We'll all be back at you next week with another installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thanks for downloading.